Hello everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I miss all your faces. I know we haven't really seen each other's faces, but I miss yours anyway. Um, we are moving on to chapter 10, Liquids and Solids. This is going to be a two-weeker. Um, so this week we are going through 10.1 through 10.3, intermolecular forces, properties of liquids, phase transitions, uh, and that's it. Next week we will go through phase diagrams, the solid state of matter, lattice structures and, and lattice structures in crystalline solids. All right, sorry, my pen was acting up for a second. All right, so just to kind of get you started and get your minds going, here is a picture of solid carbon dioxide, AKA dry ice. Um, undergoing s sublimation, meaning it goes from a solid to a gas. It doesn't become a liquid on the way. It does it by itself, or if you put it in liquid, it goes a lot faster. So, um, you know, back in the day when we had Halloween parties, um, you might have had like a cauldron and it was like bubbling and foggy, and that was from dry ice being put in it. Back when I was a kid, my dad would use dry ice for things, and at the end, when he was done with it, and he'd have extra, he would throw it in the swimming pool. It was really fun. So we are starting with 10.1, intermolecular forces. This is a really good introduction to chapter 10, because these are really what govern um, what state of matter we're dealing with. So last chapter, chapter 9, was all about gases. This chapter is focusing mostly on solids and liquids. But intermolecular forces really determine, again, what state of matter we're looking at. So in this section, we're going to describe the types of intermolecular forces possible between atoms or molecules in their condensed phases. And these are called dispersion forces, dipole-dipole attractions, and hydrogen bonding. We're going to identify the types of intermolecular forces experienced by specific molecules based on their structures. And lastly, we're going to explain the relation between the intermolecular forces present within a substance and the temperatures associated with changes in its physical state. So remember that properties of dilute gases are the same, regardless of the chemical identity of the substance. So this is talking more about ideal gases, but remember all those gas law equations we were looking at, we didn't care what the identity of the gas was. But the properties of liquids and solids very much depend on the chemical identity of a substance. So let's talk about intermolecular forces. And these are the forces of attraction that exist between atoms and molecules of a substance. Okay, so these come uh, from electrostatic phenomena. They are and they are non-covalent forces. So it's attraction between molecules. This is not bonds, so they are not intramolecular forces. Okay, intramolecular forces, these are bonds. These are what hold atoms together in a molecule. So intermolecular forces are is a molecule and a molecule being attracted to each other. Another term that we need to know is kinetic energy, which we talked about in chapter nine. Kinetic energy, your movement, we get a, a direct measurement of this using temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy. And this provides the energy required to overcome the intermolecular forces. And the differences in the properties of a solid, liquid, or gas are a result of the, difference, of the differences in strengths of the intermolecular forces that make up each substance. So these are why um, something like water is a liquid at room temperature, but methane gas is a gas at room temperature. Um, or why water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but something like ethanol, which is the alcohol you drink, you put vodka or something in the freezer and it doesn't freeze. That's for my 21 and up. If you're not 21, don't do it. All right. <laughs> So I like to compare intermolecular forces and kinetic energy to kids in a classroom. And each of these flasks that have the different states of matter in them represent our classroom. So the flask is our classroom. The particles are our kids. So the crystal and solid, we have our kids in the classroom. And in a solid, 
our particles are compact. We have the solid crystal structure. Our kids are sitting in their desks, um, but the particles are still moving. They're kind of vibrating in place. And think of that with a kid. Kids really never sit still, right? Even when they're still, they're kind of looking around. Maybe they're writing, maybe they're drawing, maybe they're like bouncing their leg up and down, but they're, they're just chilling. And then the bell rings and the kids eat lunch. So now we've given them energy. Okay, so now the bell, kids are eating lunch and then they go to recess and they start kind of filing out of the cafeteria, but they're still kind of interacting with each other. They're talking, they're walking together. Maybe they're going to go play some games together. They're still somewhat close. And then school ends and maybe they have a lollipop or something and we give them sugar. And what happens when kids eat sugar? They get crazy, right? They become gas particles and start running all over the place, maybe not even interacting with each other. Maybe they're playing hide and seek and or tag and they can't even find each other. They're just going nuts. Same type of thing. So they're not interacting with each other. And then once that sugar starts to wear off and they start getting tired, maybe they start catching each other. Maybe they're playing freeze tag, you know, and then they start interacting more. Maybe they're like, okay, let's go inside, maybe play inside or something. Now they're closer together. They're still kind of maybe doing a little bit of their own thing, but they're interacting more until eventually all that sugar wears off and the good old sugar crash happens and they all get in their sleeping bags and become a solid now. But what you can see though, is the higher the kinetic energy, the less intermolecular forces that are acting. So just an example of some of these processes, water condensing. So um, in A, you know, when you're drinking um, an ice, iced tea or ice soda or something, especially if it's hot outside, and then you start getting this condensation on your drink. It's not the glass sweating. It's, air, it's water vapor that was in the air. And it was able to slow down enough to go from the gas phase to the liquid phase. And it condenses on the glass. And then B is fog, which is kind of the process of... Um, that water, you can see it starting to condense kind of into small water droplets. And these are actually liquid. They're not quite gases anymore. And they're just kind of floating in the air, starting to settle down onto the water. We can also liquefy gases by compressing them. So you get, you push them closer and closer together, you put that pressure on and you're forcing them to interact with each other until eventually they get close enough to form a liquid. An example is butane, which is in our lighters. So the storage compartment is compressing that butane so that it becomes a liquid. And then we can use our butane lighters. I swear I've gotten that exact same lighter from like the 99 cent store. So now let's talk about these forces between molecules, our intermolecular forces. The strength of them vary for different substances. But just one thing keep in mind is all of our intermolecular forces are much, much weaker than an intramolecular forces. They're not, they're much weaker than covalent bonds. They're not bonds, they are interactions. Okay, so we have three types of them. Dispersion forces, dipole-dipole attractions, and hydrogen bonding. Note, hydrogen bonding is not an actual bond. It's just a very strong attraction. Okay, so a lot of times we call these forces collectively van der Waals forces. Remember the van der Waals equation that took attractions into account? Connections. So here's just a um, picture showing you kind of the difference between an intramolecular force and an intermolecular force. So for instance, this, these are HCl molecules and the bond between hydrogen and chlorine is an intramolecular force. It's very, very strong. But this partial 
uh, positive on the hydrogen and the partial negative on the chlorine are attracted to each other in an intermolecular force. Okay, it's a weak force, but it's an attraction. They're like, hey, I'm a little par positive, you're a little negative. They're kind of talking a little bit. So we're going to dig deeper into our three main intermolecular forces. The first and the weakest type is the dispersion forces. Every single type of substance has dispersion forces, polar and nonpolar. The other name for these are London dispersion forces. And so what happens with these is you, the electrons in a molecule or an atom are constantly moving. And you might have it where maybe you've got, you know, your molecule here. Uh, I'm just going to do it like this. Your molecule here, and you got your electrons buzzing around. But something happens, maybe it gets bumped, or just it so happens that the electrons make it so that your molecule maybe gets kind of oval where your electrons are all the way over on this side. And this is an instantaneous thing. So out of nowhere, you've got a kind of partial negative and then a partial positive because of this. And then that happens in another molecule that maybe has a partial positive and its electrons are over here. And then you get these, these very weak interactions instantaneous dipoles. They don't last. They're here and gone. So this distorts the electrons, making an induced dipole. So like this one has this instantaneous dipole, and then it sees another molecule or atom and, and, go, and makes it kind of have that partial positive to attract to it. Okay, so it induces that dipole. Okay, these are very, very weak electrostatic attraction so that we call dispersion forces. Even our nonpolar compounds do this. Um, but again, these are very, very weak attractions. They don't last long. They're very quick here and gone. Here it is drawn a lot better than I can do. So these are both nonpolar diatomic molecules, but they have these very temporary dipoles that form, forming these dispersion forces. Now, the heavier that a molecule or an atom is, the stronger the disp dispersion forces, because you have more electrons in them, and that means that they can have higher polarizability, so they can have these polar moments more often. The valence electrons are farther from the nucleus. They're not as attracted to it. So polarizability is the measure of how easy or difficult it is for another electrostatic charge to distort a molecule's charge distribution. The shapes of molecules also affects the magnitude of the dispersion forces between them. So when you have long-chained uh, molecules, they are going to have more surface area for other molecules to interact with. For instance, if you have a really long carbon chain, um, I'm going to go into kind of OCHEM mode here and draw a organic molecule. Each, both the ends and each bend here represent a carbon, and then it, they just have hydrogens to fill it in. But if you have something like this guy, you can have another one stack right on top of it, and so on and so forth. They can interact a lot more. Whereas if you have something that's more compact, so if you have like one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like this guy, this is much more compact. There's less surface area. I can't stack another molecule like it very close because like you have these branches up here, they're getting in the way. So you have less surface area, less dispersion forces, and then that means it's going to have um, less polarizability, uh, le again, less dispersion forces. The less dispersion forces, the lower the uh, melting point or the boiling point. Okay, so the melting point is the temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid, boiling point where the liquid becomes a gas. And you can see for the halogens, remember they're all diatomic, as that molar mass is going up, the atomic radius is also going up, and those melting points and boiling points are all going up. Okay, so bigger more dispersion forces, so they have more interactions, so then it takes more energy 
to break up those intermolecular forces and get them to change state. Because we need to overcome those intermolecular forces and make those particles move faster and faster so that we overcome it, those forces, and they're able to break free and do their own thing. Okay, so these are just some examples also. Um, every single one of these compounds has the same formula and molecular mass. Um, but, so they're all C5H12. Okay, these are isomers of each other, same formula, different um, configuration. But you can see the one N-pentane at the far right here has the highest boiling point because it has more contact area. Isopentane has a lower boiling point, but it has less surface area, less attraction than N-pentane, but still has more available than neopentane, which has the smallest amount of contact area shown here and the weakest attraction between molecules. So I thought we would look at an example about London forces and their effects. We want to order the following compounds of a group 14 element and hydrogen from lowest to highest boiling point, CH4, SiH4, GH4, and SNH4. And we want to talk about our reasoning. So these are all group 14 elements. So that means, so we're going, if you were look at the periodic table, it goes carbon and then silicon and then germanium and then tin. So just taking that into account, we know that tin is going to be the biggest. I'm just ignoring the hydrogens because they each have four hydrogens. That, you know, it doesn't really make a difference. We're really looking at the, that central atom. The tin here has the highest molar mass, right? Which means it's going to have the most intermolecular forces and the most inter interactions with each other, which means it should have the highest uh, boiling point. And then followed by germanium, then silicon, and then carbon. And you can also see that in this graph here, where you have the temperature on the y-axis, the period on the x-axis, Carbon is in period two, and so methane has a boiling point around 100, negative 160 degrees Celsius. SiH4 is around negative 120, GeH4 negative 90, and SnH4 is around what, negative 50? Okay, so you can see that the larger the molar mass, the higher the boiling point. This is just a really cool thing, geckos, are, can stick to like anything, right? They, you can have a gecko go climb up walls and whatnot. And I think it was around uh, the 2000s is when they actually just thought, uh, found why. And geckos actually use dispersion forces. So their toes have all these tiny hairs called setae, setae, ask a biologist how to pronounce it. And these are gonna branch into triangular tips called spatulae. So they use their van der Waals attractions between whatever surface they're crawling and all these spatulae. And how they contact this surface is how they turn their stickiness on and off. So they can flex their toes to change their stickiness. So when they curl their toes, they're able to stick to a surface and when they uncurl them is when they can unstick, which is how they're able to move across surfaces. All right, the next intermolecular force is dipole-dipole attractions. So these do not occur in nonpolar molecules. These are only molecules that have permanent dipoles. Okay, so only polar molecules. These are stronger attraction than dispersion forces. So this means that these are going to have higher melting and boiling points because we need more energy to overcome those intermolecular forces. So polar molecules have both dipole-dipole attractions and dispersion forces. Everything has dispersion forces, but that's all that nonpolar molecules have. Once we hit polarity, then we add dipole-dipole attractions. So what happens is you have two molecules that line up where the partial negative of one 
gets as close as it can to the partial positive of another. And here's an example how they might arrange themselves. So this could be something like HCl, hydrogen chloride, that allow the attraction between the partial negative and the partial positive. So if we were to compare polar and nonpolar molecules that have similar molar masses, having those st these stronger dipole-dipole attractions in polar molecules ha um, have, makes them have a small to moderate increase in their boiling points compared to a nonpolar molecule that just has dispersion forces. So if we wanted to, for example, predict the higher boiling point between nitrogen gas or carbon monoxide, we, could, we would look at their structures. So these are both diatomic molecules, though nitrogen is the same atom in both. Um, but carbon monoxide is polar. Okay, so carbon monoxide, you have a triple bond between carbon and oxygen, I believe. Looks like that. Um, and nitrogen also... These two have triple bonds to each other. But carbon monoxide has a dipole. Nitrogen does not. So because carbon monoxide is a polar molecule, it has dipole-dipole attractions to other carbon monoxide molecules. So it's going to have more attractions, meaning a higher boiling point than the nitrogen molecules. All right, the last type of intermolecular force is called hydrogen bonding. Now, this is only present in certain polar molecules. It's a very, very strong type of dipole-dipole attraction, but not an actual bond, okay? It's about 10% the strength of a, um, of a covalent bond, okay? So it's a strong attraction, but not, an, not strong enough to be an actual bond. But it is the strongest van der Waals force. So the way that we have hydrogen bonding is you need to have a hydrogen, of course, that is covalently bonded to one of the three most electronegative elements, either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. The way you can remember it, hydrogen bonding is fun. So if you have a molecule where hydrogen is bonded to one of these three, you will have hydrogen bonding present as an intermolecular force. For example, water. Okay, um, hydrogen bonding is part of the reason that water has the properties it does. Because you have the oxygens that can hydrogen bond with two hydrogens, and then each hydrogen is able to um, hydrogen bond with other oxygens. So you can see this going on with all these different molecules, how they're interacting with each other. So these are strong intermolecular forces because of the highly concentrated partial charges. Because you have a really big separate, a relatively big separation of charge between the very electronegative fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, and the much less electropositive or electronegative um, hydrogen. Okay, um, and the hydrogen is small, and so are fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So if we were to look at groups 15, 16, and 17 hydrides, uh, we see their boiling points increasing for, uh, with increasing molecular mass in periods 3, 4, and 5. Notice period 2 was left out of this. Okay, so this is where we would predict period 2 would be. So like fluorine, for instance, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. But in reality... They're all the way up here with their boiling points. Um, and this is showing H2O, HF, and NH3. So these are the hydrides of fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. And we see these much higher boiling points because of hydrogen bonding. That H bond, though. All right. Very, very strong intermolecular force. Where they are very much, where they're able to interact much stronger with each other. So let's look at an example. 
consider the compounds dimethyl ether, CH3OCH3, ethanol, CH3CH2OH, and propane, CH3CH2CH3. Their boiling points, not necessarily in order, are negative 42.1, negative 24.8, and 78.4 degrees Celsius. Match each compound with its boiling point and explain your reasoning. So, if we look at these, okay, the first one we should look at here is propane. Propane, there's no polarity at all to it. So, no polarity means no intermolecular forces, so that means it's going to have this lower boiling point of negative 42.1, okay? So propane, negative 42.1. We'll color code this. Next, we look at, we can look at ethanol. Okay, let's look at ethanol next. And we see it has an OH. That means hydrogen bonding. If it has a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, that means it can have hydrogen bonding. So that means that this molecule is gonna have dispersion forces, it's got polarity, so it's gonna have dipole-dipole, and it's got hydrogen bonding. So this guy should have our highest boiling point of 78.4. And lastly, looking at dimethyl ether, it has an oxygen in it, which gives it some polarity, which means, okay, it should have some dipole-dipole interactions, some dispersion forces, but there's no hydrogen bonded to that oxygen, so it can't hydrogen bond with anything. So it's going to have this middle boiling point of negative 24.8. Um, just to give you some, um, some interconnection with biology, DNA has this structure because of hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, adenine and thymine are hydrogen bonding. These base, so the base pairs use hydrogen bonding to uh, pair up with each other. Um, adenine and thymine actually have two hydrogen bonds with each other. Cytosine and guanine share three. I had to read that right out of the textbook because I am not a biology person. All right, and this is um, kind of a close-up if you're looking from the top down of a DNA molecule. So you can see the sugar phosphate backbones, but then you can also see the hydrogen bonds going on, giving the DNA its shape. 